In this episode of Idea City. Insects show us a different way of life. In a sense, they break all the rules that we have about the way we think things are supposed to work. And there's no place where that's clearer than in matters pertaining to sex. Also. Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. And so, uh, what is it? 70 plus percent of the planet is covered in water, and we've only explored about 3% of that entity. Um, the bulk of the planet is beetles. Go figure. Dark matter rules in space. We don't know very much. And here's another realm of the peculiar. Marlene Zook, she um, researches insect sex. And she says, as someone who works on sexual behavior in animals, I've grown used to getting a lot of off-the-wall questions about curi from curious members of the general public. Topping the list is homosexuality and whether it occurs in species other than our own. And another inexplicably popular area of inquiry is whether animals exhibit oral sex. <laughs> How would you know in the case of beetles? <laughs> and is there any cure for this infestation along the lines of sex? Is that a way that we might possibly stop them? Well, thank you. It turns out that people are more afraid of insects than they are of dying, at least if you want to believe a 1973 survey that was published in the Book of Lists. Uh, public speaking and uh, heights came in as the first two, but then right after that was insects. Uh, death was uh, number six. I think if you put spiders in with insects and ask people about fear of the multi-legged, that would have topped. Absolutely, number one, no question, in terms of people's fears. At the same time, we're all really fascinated by insects. And scientists have been using insects for centuries to try and understand the answers to life's biggest questions. Some of the greatest minds on Earth, from Jean-Henri Fabre to Charles Darwin to E.O. Wilson, have focused their attention on some of the smallest minds to try to figure out the way the world works. Now, what is it about insects that does this to us? Why do we keep coming back to them? Some of it, of course, is their sheer numbers. Um, as you've heard before, they form the majority of species on Earth. Uh, there are, in fact, between 1 and 10 million different kinds of insects. It depends who you ask and how they figure it out. Um, to try and put this in perspective, if you wanted to have an insect of the month calendar and not repeat a species every month, uh, you could go on for 80,000 years and do that, and you'd never have to repeat. You know, take that, pandas and kittens. You know, this, this is really quite an accomplishment. <laughs> and so insects are really important. But at the same time, the reason I keep coming back to them and the reason I like studying them is something that I think is more profound. And that's that insects show us a different way of life. In a sense, they break all the rules that we have about the way we think things are supposed to work. And there's no place where that's clearer than in matters pertaining to sex. And so here, this is the message. Actually, if you don't take anything else from my talk, you should take this one. Sex in insects is more interesting than sex in people. And I stand with that even with some of the information that we've heard earlier this afternoon. <laughs> Stay with me. Once you understand about sex in insects, Sex in people just seems kind of stereotyped and 
pedestrian, and boring. In damselflies and many other insects, males use their genitalia like a, a shovel, and so the, the penis, which is shown in the bottom part of the slide here, looks kind of almost like a Swiss army knife with all the attachments pulled out, but what it's, and what it's used for is to scoop out the sperm from previous mates. Great ideas are meant to be shared. Join the discussion on Facebook. Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. For one thing, the first rule we all learned about sex is that it's what you have to do in order to make babies. But there are insects that can reproduce without sex. They break that rule right away. The aphids that are on your rose bushes right now are busily popping out baby aphids without the benefit of having mated. Virgin birth, right there, in your garden at this very moment. The social insects, the bees, the wasps, and ants, are a little bit more cavalier about mating and using sperm. The queen, who produces all of the other uh, members of the colony, will have sex and use uh, fertilized eggs, uh, use the sperm to produce daughters, but then she makes sons without the benefit of sperm at all. Insects compete with each other, not just physically before mating, but with their sperm. And I have to say that, you know, I, I heard the talk earlier, mammals are just chumps when it comes to sperm competition. The real champions of sperm competition are the insects. There are some species of fruit flies that have individual sperm cells that are longer than their own bodies. You can see here uh, six of them coiled up next to the uh, egg just to get an idea of the relative size. And the testis of these male fruit flies, this is one uncoiled here next to uh, his body, is more than 10% of his body weight. I will pause briefly and allow you to do the math and imagine what that would mean if for a human male, 10% body Okay, yeah, you guys are good at math, okay. Um, so what that tells you is that for insects, investment in sperm is a really big deal. And it's a really big deal because sperm competition is extremely common. And sperm competition occurs in a couple of ways. In damselflies and many other insects, males use their genitalia like a, a shovel to scoop out the sperm of previous mates and replace it with their own. And so the, the penis, which is shown in the bottom part of the slide here, looks kind of almost like a Swiss army knife with all the attachments pulled out. But what it's, and what it's used for is to scoop out the sperm from previous mates. And so, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is a penis. I, the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the <laughs> statement earlier about, you know, the formation of the human, really boring. Uh, some of you may remember Bee Movie from a few years ago in which Jerry Seinfeld played a slacker worker honeybee who was seeking to escape the tedium of the hive or factory. Now, whatever else you might think about Jerry Seinfeld, it is absolutely undeniable that he makes a terrible worker honeybee. Uh, not because of any of his talents, but because all worker honeybees, all of the bees you see flitting from flower to flower, gathering nectar, going back to the hive, all of the worker ants that you see going across your kitchen counter into the sugar bowl or whatever, all of them, all of them, every single one is a female. There are no worker male social insects. There are three classes of honeybees, the workers and the queens, which are both female, and the drones, and the drones are male. They exist for a very short period of time. He finds a virgin queen, mates with her, immediately on mating, his genitalia explode, he falls to the ground and dies. Get the latest idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at ideacityonline.com. Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. 
It took until, in fact, the late 1600s for a Dutch scientist, Jan Swammerdam, to determine that, in fact, there are three classes of honey honeybees, the workers and the queens, which are both female, the queen does all the reproducing, and the drones, and the drones are male. They exist for a very short period of time. They leave the nest, they fly in search of a virgin queen to mate with. If the, I always tell my students, if they're, uh, the drone is really lucky, he finds a virgin queen, mates with her, immediately on mating, his genitalia explode, he falls to the ground and dies. Um, and I always point out that this is the best possible outcome uh, for him because, of course, the alternative is he just dies anyway after a couple of days and, you know, will not have left any genes in the next generation. I'm, I've never been, I don't think my students ever really believe that, but, uh, but it, it really is true. So people have told a lot of stories about honeybees and a lot of um, cultures and groups have held them up as models because of their cooperation, their industriousness. The Masons, the Mormons um, have all used uh, hives as symbols. For a little while, um, the, uh, uh, the Victorians uh, in England knew that uh, they did figure out that the workers were female and they knew they didn't uh, reproduce. And so the uh, worker honeybees were held up as an example for young women because of their chastity. Um, although I'm not sure that ever really worked out as much of an inspiration. So what do we take then from insects? I think sometimes they offer us a mirror of our own behavior. They do things that are a lot like what we do. They build complex structures. They communicate using symbols. They raise their offspring for long periods of time. And yet they do that in vastly different ways from us because they lack our big brains. They don't have a cerebrum, they don't have a cerebellum, they don't have the right and left hemispheres. And so they show us that you don't need a big brain to do big things. Other times, instead of being a mirror of what we do, they offer us a glimpse into something completely different. There are moths and butterflies that can see colors we can't because they can look into the ultraviolet. They let us see what life is like with different rules. And most of all for me, I like insects because they're so hard to identify with. Unlike our pets, we can't look at them and think of them like little people in fursuits. They seem really alien to us, and I think that's a good thing because it makes us see that all of life is not the way that humans are. So I think that insects really show us another way to do things, another way that's natural, that's normal, and in doing so, I think the insects really show us a lot about what it means to be human. Thank you very much. That's lovely, my lady. So I think I remember reading that Sexual cannibalism is widespread in the insect realm. Is that true? It is. I will also, if you, especially if you want to extend it to spiders, yes. And what would be the purpose of that? I mean, wouldn't an exploding genital be enough? <laughs> From the, well, so two things. One thing, of course, from the, from the standpoint of the male, um, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, really, um, because, you know, you're dead, you're dead. From the standpoint of the female, the exploding genitals are fine, but really, otherwise, she would get a meal. So the sexual cannibalism is really kind of better from her perspective. <laughs> That's bracing. <laughs> <laughs> and and when, when I read that it's widespread, are we talking about unique examples or really widespread? No, no I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I, let's, let's put it like that, okay? I, I wouldn't feel like it's encroaching onto, say, mammals, for example. I, I would not spend a lot of time being concerned. Well, that's a relief. Uh, thank you so much. Let's have our picture. <laughs> Get the latest Idea City news instantly. Follow us on Twitter.
Moses Neimer's Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. If I could get Donnie Walsh, Chuck Jackson, Pat Carey, Michael Fanfara, Gary Kendall, and Mike Fitzpatrick out here, they are the Downchild Blues Band.
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Thank you. The idea city is a place where ideas come face to face <laughs> to inspire and, and give us hope. hope. At this time, uh, our planet needs it. Most idea city is a place. Where everybody sing. Where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope. At this time, our planet needs it. Most idea city.